so um, unfortunately i lost i skipped the first part i hope everything uh, went well for this second series of presentation we gave the name of writing the, the city and i'm going to make a, a short introduction that i called Expre expressive diversity in telling your urban places in 1947, French writer uh, Raymond Quenot wrote Exercises in Style, one among many of his experimental works in which he followed the precepts of the group known as Ulipo, that he founded with the mathematician François Le Lyonnais. Ulipo uh, is the acronym of, for Ouvreur de Littérature Potentielle that we could roughly translate as workshop of potential literature. In this singular text, he imposes to himself a strict and precise constraint or assignment consisting in retelling an anodyne urban event in 99 ways, each one of them uh, in a different style. The event in question refers to a person who witnesses an altercation between a man eccentrically dressed and another passenger within a bus in Paris. And then sees the same man two hours later at the Saint-Lazare train station getting advice on adding a button to his overcoat. Among these 99 retelling, we can find styles such as oniric style, metaphoric style, retrograde style, hesitative style, official letter style, onomatopoietic style, philosophic style, sonnet style, olfactory style, tactile style, out style, medical style, zoological style, probabilistic style, portrait style, etc., etc. When dealing with uh, urban places, conceived or not by architects or urbanists, represented by the literary medium, that is the writing, we often tend to observe what is represented rather than how it's represented. That means that we usually limit our understanding of these urban places to their very diegetical characteristics and leave aside the literary language in which they are expressed. This restrictive approach is explicitly condemned by French philosopher Louis Marin, who argues that, and I quote, the whole historical imagery of description and mimesis is built on the transitive dimension of representation, that is, representing something, by forgetting its reflective opacity and its modalities, that is, presenting something. And I close the the quote. So, uh, Kenos' exercise in a style seemed to take into account this historical criticism in regard to a phenomenology of representation to produce what we might call an hypertext, that is, the cohabitation of multiple representations of a single fact in order to deconstruct it, and where the qualities of expression, the how, get the upper hand of the objective fact, of the objective fact, the what. The multiplication of a single fact in 99 different ways, or ways of expressing it, in which each one of them focus in a special aspect, leads the reader to inevita inevitably doubt of the une unequivocal nature of the fact itself. In Kenos' work, what finally matters is the expression, and with it, the transmission of a singular aesthetical effect from writer to reader. Indeed, it is according to the way the fact is told that the reader is going to imagine it, to experience it, and even to judge it. So description and narration are never, never neutral. The point of view of the narrator, the choice of the verb tense, the choice of a precise vocabulary and the use of a precise uh, syntax 
among many language possibilities are going to have a direct incidence on the very perception of the fact or the event itself. Now, exercise in a style is not, strictly speaking, a scientific method because there is no any demonstrative intention in Keno's work. But uh, what we can see is rather a creative tool or a literary device conceived and developed by the writer to exhaust the language possibilities of a place in order to create a kaleidoscopic vision of it. Nevertheless, its logic could be taken by someone else and implemented somewhere else, other than in a bus or a square in Paris, in a monument in Moscow, in a highway in Los Angeles, in a neighborhood in Buenos Aires, for instance. What interests us here is the methodolog methodological potential of some writing devices and their maneuverability and their applicability. So uh, for this second series of presentations, we will not consider writing in its most evident form, but rather in its very essence. That is as a trace, as an expanded practice of printing. The seventh presentation journey we are going to witness follows a sequence going from words to images, from literary tools to visual devices, including hybrids between them, where disciplinary boundaries are blurred in order to promote an epistemological experimentation. So uh, we're going to start with Serap Durmus Oster who's a member of the working group three, Sarah. Thank hello. you. Thank you, Esteban, uh, for your presentation. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to pre give some mm, to present you okay. in a precise way. So Sarah Dormus Osterk is an associate professor at Karadeniz Technical University, Department of Architecture in Trasbon, Turkey. She has a PhD in architecture and her research interests include rhetoric, narrative, analysis tools and methods for architecture. Serap. Thank you, Esteban, again. Um, hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here uh, for the webinar and be part of the course section, Writing Urban Places, um, and be part of the webinar organization committee. Thank you all of you. Uh, I prepare my presentation the, uh, to discuss the opportunities of the method and its ways uh, as an example of brainstorming. Um, it's an assignment aimed at presenting just an overlook to urban narrativity and gives, uh, as an example, uh, gives and some examples from the six term design studio uh, in architecture. Uh, with the question of the whether data can become a pigment uh, to create urban narrativity with different patterns of information like reading, spelling, writing, thinking, interpreting, acting, mapping, etc. can be discussed with various tools. Writing the city uh, through narrative is an effort to reach a theoretical and written city form uh, with a textual perspective. While deep digging on city data, uh, its outcome includes data on recreating the city. Urban Place um, is a precious space to uh, bring together different research areas in order to respond to a complex place. Writing the city, on the other hand, is one of the crucial urban interests that intend to reveal the relationship between narratives and architecture and focuses on its forms of expression. In this context, Urban narrativity aims to examine the narratives about the city with its interests, architectural and literary references. The urban place, which has a complex structure, becomes textual by being fragmented within the framework of architecture and literature and, and reconstructed uh, like a sentence over and over again with other ways. This assignment aims to adopt a potential method called urban narratives, which is a bridge concept and try to assemble various 
race for understanding the city. Urban narrative is also a juxtaposed and overlapped concept that involves the merging of many ways and tools. The method proposed is, um, in fact, the assembly of multiple existing methods or ways belonging to architecture and belonging to discipline of architecture and used by the discipline of architecture itself, as well as one of the literature. Uh, it consists of the procedures um, that examine a series of literary states of many ways and tools. Literal states that Paul Ricoeur points out in the article, uh, Architecture and Narrativity, constitute the layers of the method and create appropriate stages. The data of the city which, which includes text, voices, interviews, routes, maps, and photographs of the urban place are divided into the sections in these three literal states. Prefiguration stage is tied up in everyday life, in conversation, and these narratives make sense in exchange of memories and of experiences and of projects. Configuration stage, which is the logical state, that uh, penetrates the literary shepherd and his has three parts, implotment, intelligibility, and intertextuality. And the last one, config, uh, refiguration stage, the reading on the side of narrative, the reapproachment between narrative and architecture is narrower in the context, context of reading and rereading. The necessary and sufficient condition of narrativity was the present uh, in a text of a narrator telling a story. Narratives tell us stories of the past, present, and future in urban places. The moods of narrativity are the games that the mind plays with narrative structures in the production and reception of the text. According to Ryan, mood is formulated as a mental operation. It shows that the candidates for the mood of narrativity can be used in urban places. Uh, like simple, multiple, complex, proliferating, diluted, embryonic, braided, underlying, figural, empty, instrumental, deferred narrativity types. The moods of narrativity are the ways of looking at the places and spaces as a text. According to Chatman, the environment which situates objects and characters more specifically, the environment in which characters more move or live it. Along with characters, space belongs to existence of a narrative. Some examples uh, from the design studio you will see on slide are the selected diagrams that created through data in different cities of Turkey within the context of the moods of narrativity in urban places. The multiple narrativity definition says that each narrative creates its own semantic universe and concerns with different characters. The unifying principle of organization is located in a framing narrative in which the stories are told as fiction or as entertaining anecdotes. In this case, it maps with the neutral states of record with different data of urban places. Another example is from diluted narrativity that the reader is less concerned with finding out story ends than with visualizing the setting, experiencing its atmosphere, achieving intimacy with the minds of characters. The visual diluted met metaphor, diluted narrativity, is a picture in large areas of the canvas, do not a distinct shape, but are used for color effects and for compositional balance. This diagram from a different city, is called Trabzon, is an example that tries to reveal many experiences and activities such as crafts, food, travel, and fishing. And this diagram for the same city, Trabzon, wants to show that memory and identity visible uh, with historical research. While doing this, the students uh, use the techniques such as um, interviews, short trips, and old photographs. In conclusion, urban narrative that aims to perceive the space literally can make sense of it by reproducing it with tools based on the data from city uh, and the different codes. Every diagram put forward by the narrative codes 
is placed in the relevant literal states. And while this full procedure offers a literal level of textual representation, it becomes a creative act of writing the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this rich presentation. Thank you, Sarah. The next presentation is uh, from Alexandra uh, Porcinesco. Unfortunately, uh, she's not here with us, but she left us the his uh, PowerPoint. So, Carlos, if you can send it to everyone. Hello, everybody, and thanks for having me today at your webinar. My name is Alexandra Pornichesco from Bucharest, Romania. And today I'm going to tell you about stream of consciousness. It is a literary technique which can act as a narrative device for exploring, analyzing and revealing the inner subjective city by making known the voices of the city. I chose this technique because it is through thoughts, words, associations, gestures and actions that characters in fictional works project themselves onto the place they inhabit or they wish to inhabit. The city is seen as a written discourse or a composition, and the viewpoint of the inhabitant help reveal and explore the interior or subjective city. The stream of consciousness technique aims at analyzing the reflection of the mental structures and perceptions on the ever-changing urban tissue. The concept was transferred from psychology and applied in a literary context. It addresses social, historical, and cultural issues. The objective of the method is to document, collect, and gather individual or personalized written evidence of the space perception of a given urban territory, with a focus on the members of the respective community. The resulting insight and data may lead to a participatory approach of the community needs and may subsequently prove useful in, rethink re in rethinking the shared space and in improving common well-being. The procedure centers on the inhabitants' contribution, and this can be collected by means of questionnaires and surveys. Also, creative writing competitions, focusing on either poetry, fiction, diaries, essays, or others, all drawing on the image of the city. Also, the creation of a collective novel bearing witness of the individual's intimate relationship with the city. With works carried out by multidisciplinary teams, the outcome can also be the production of best practices guides, setting the standards for engaging, inclusive and tolerant cities, closer to the spirit of the place and that of its inhabitants. However, the method based on the stream of consciousness technique might show its limitations unless it takes into account covering several criteria, in the sense that the writing initiative needs to reach out to different social categories, various ethnic and age groups, with a view to outlining a more complex yet composite image of the city. Therefore, these limitations can be turned into opportunities, as different layers and perspectives of the city can be accessed and analyzed. In addition, the method is potentially applicable to different urban contexts, since it is accessible, flexible, spontaneous in nature. Besides, it is rooted in essential mental processes and involves the individual's inherent connection to the inhabited space. However, attention should be paid to the mix of reality and illusion intrinsic to the character's train of thoughts. The general theoretical frame, framework will further concentrate on construction of meaning, narrative form, and the characteristics of the literary method. This narrative technique deals with patterns of thought that generate unique individualized spatial patterns and configurations. These are subsequently mirrored in writing. Hence, individuals that are part of the community create their own written versions of the urban space. Once several or more of these grids or patterns are put together, they can collide, overlap, mix, and influence each other in order to generate an encompassing, yet often divergent, writing cue of that particular city, drawing on what can be called the common vision of the community inhabiting that space. It is part of a communicative flow made out of a variety of fragments that contain raw thoughts and feelings and ideas. All these obey an inner order dictated by the mental events going on in the character's mind. 
It is like a fast-moving stream encompassing the character's thought processes. This translates into an interior monologue triggered by very sensory reactions to external occurrences, generating authentic and instinctive associations, gestures, and actions. One of the human exponents of the technique is typically the planeur or planeuse, who develops a strong bond with the city through observation, interaction, participation, while constructing or reconstructing both themselves and the places they inhabit in a mutual enterprise. In our case study, Romanian writer Adriana Beatles' heroine, a messenger type character, acts like a living and sensitive repository of urban images gathered during the short trip she takes around the city as part of her work-related tasks of collecting articles and photographs. She ultimately identifies with the images her mind accumulates and stores. She also projects her impressions and feelings on the houses she encounters while devising likely stories unfolding behind the exterior walls. The houses and the streets are personificated and analyzed in virtue of their architectural details and overall aspect, which turns them into supporting urban characters. Her journeys reveal a kind of effectively colored puzzle. Places, homes and destinies are all connected by her steps and thoughts. Interdependent yet mobile fragments of urban landscape are brought together following the root, the roots of her mental map. At times, the stream of consciousness or the literary flow is triggered by the occasional encounter with other minor characters. This brings back urban details and impressions, like in a play of present and past. The paths she had been taken across Bucharest outline an emotional iconography of the city, as the constant and unpredictable flow of ideas and impressions lures the reader into the atmosphere, into the past reality of the city, recreating that l'air du temps which is brought vividly into contemporary memory. From a syntactic and grammatical, grammatical point of view, the character's train of thought is distinguished by fluidity, unaffectedness and artlessness, including short and frequent fragments of direct speech. The writing also distinguishes itself through the repetition of certain light motives, a nonlinear structure and the use of multiple voices. Visually, the text is somewhat similar to a watercolor sketch of the city. The few brush strokes are sometimes barely visible, yet strong enough to add to the essence of the image before turning into a blank page, ready to be rewritten all over again, time after time, writer after writer. The language of space can be reconstructed through writing, one inhabitant at a time, in an attempt to explore and connect our inner and exterior space. Thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, we cannot thank uh, Alexandra, but uh, okay, we're gonna continue. Uh, the next presentation is from Daniel Alves. He is assistant professor in the history department and researcher at the Institute of Contemporary History, both at Nova FSSH, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa. He has a PhD in contemporary economic and social history, and his fields of research are Portuguese history, economic and social history, GAS applied to history and digital humanities. Daniel, welcome. Hello, Stefan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the, the invitation for being here presenting uh, our project, the Atlas of Literary Landscapes of Portugal. Um, I'm going to make the, the presentation already recorded so I can keep in the, in the tight schedule that, that we have. Uh, so um, you are going to hear me speak uh, recording one month ago. Uh, can I share the screen? Yes, please. Okay. The Atlas of Literary Landscapes of okay. in Portugal is a digital humanities project initiated in 2010 by Ana Isabel Queiroz at the New University of Lisbon. Currently, it's coordinated by Natalia Constancio and Daniela. Um, as a digital humanities project, uh, it is collaborative, interdisciplinary, and of course, digital. 
uh, collaborative because it's uh, um, based on the work of more than 50 readers, researchers uh, that came from various areas uh, of science, from the humanities, from the environmental sciences or the computer sciences. And it uses uh, digital tools and methodologies for data collection, analysis and dissemination. Um, the project has four main objectives. Uh, to link literature to the territory, valuing the literary works and the landscapes represented on them, to contribute to the knowledge of the natural and cultural heritage, to study the ecological and historical patterns and processes associated with current landscapes, and finally, to contribute to environmental literacy and tourism. The uh, Atlas uh, methodology uh, form a literary corpus um, that collects uh, literary uh, descriptions of landscape. Uh, those uh, descriptions are collected in literature from mid 19th century to the present day. Um, it collects descriptions of uh, landscape of mainland Portugal and those descriptions have to uh, have a minimum reference to a territorial unit like the ones we see in the map or mention a specific place. As an inter interdisciplinary work uh, of course it bases uh, its main knowledge uh, in literature. Uh, most of the colleagues that collaborate in the project came from this disciplinary area, but also incorporates knowledge from many other disciplines, from biology to history, from tourism to ecology and other areas. It uses digital tools for collecting, analyzing and dissemination of the information about the literary landscapes. It uses this uh, collaborative database that collects centrally all the records, all the data from the project, but also it's used to share that knowledge among all the readers, uh, all the collaborators in the, in the project. Uh, each reader, each collaborator, uh, as soon as it collects information as soon as it collaborates with a project um, as access to all the other information that is available in the database. Those tools uh, are also used for dissemination and for analysis. Uh, we use a geographic information system to analyze and visualize all the information. And also we have a web, a mobile app accessible to all uh, in that address there. As uh, of March 2021, uh, literary uh, landscapes in the Atlas database amount to almost uh, 8,000 uh, uh, literary excerpts that are group it into five categories and 27 teams uh, collected from almost uh, 400 uh, literary works uh, written by uh, almost 200 authors. Uh, these works were um, published between 1843 and 2019 um, and they were collected into the database uh, by uh, 52 readers now. Uh, from all the literary descriptions, they are classified in the database uh, with a, a set of teams and categories. Uh, and here you can see uh, the most frequent, most common of those uh, teams and categories in the Atlas uh, uh, database. 
we can say that the fauna and flora species are the ones that are more present in the uh, in the database uh, but also other uh, teams other categories like agriculture or um, uh, florist uh, commerce uh, rivers or valleys and so on um, these um, uh, teams and categories uh, reflect also the research agenda of all the readers, all the researchers that collaborates in the in the project. Uh, the project is open uh, for more collaborations. Uh, it's an open-handed uh, uh, pro uh, project, uh, and if you want to collaborate, you can send us an email and uh, you can join the team and uh, collaborate in this in this project uh, thank you for uh, your attention and see you soon thank you very much daniel for showing us again this amazing and huge project i remember to so to see some advances some years ago in Lisbon. And it's amazing to see this, this yeah, structure, thank you. This, the behind the scenes of this yeah. amazing project. Thank you and sorry for the, <laughs> the confusion. <laughs> Don't worry. So uh, the next presentation is from uh, Victoria Bogdanova. Victoria is a member of the working group three and she's a poet, an architect, investigating poem drawing as a processual mode in creative research. She's currently undertaking a PhD in, in Ljubljana and under the name of Emotive Immersion Through Poem Drawing in Spatial Design. Victoria, welcome. <laughs> we can hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm uh, very happy and grateful to be here with you today. Um, as Esteban has introduced, uh, my field of research is uh, poem drawing, which is actually an environment between poetry and drawing as uh, instruments uh, for uh, architectural research. Uh, and they mainly aim to uh, enhance the sensitivity and tenderness in spatial uh, perception, but also spatial design and transformation. Or at least this is the definition that I am uh, obliged to give in academic circles. Uh, if I try to, to explain that in uh, simple wor words, I would say that um, a poem drawing is a way to um, make friends with someone, make friends with users of the, of the place, make friends with the characters you're designing, uh, to make friends with the place or the street you're perceiving, but also with your colleagues. I would like to open the uh, presentation with one citation by David White. Friendship is a mirror to presence and a testament to forgiveness. Friendship is a mirror to presence and a testament to forgiveness. So in this perspective, I think that uh, being present to what we design and being present to what we perceive in uh, the places that we visit and that we inhabit is uh, to actually be able to forgive uh, not only to the people with which we interact every day and which we encounter in those places, but also to the places themselves, the places that hurts, that have hurt us and that um, um, contain some negative emotion. Um, so what we see in this first slide is actually the steps of building a poem drawing. And it is one character, it is the tower, uh, the messenger tower that we designed with my friends, Danica, Elina, uh, Maria and Milka and it was about uh, a traveling theater in Skopje uh, and these three uh, personalities the tower the table and the curtain wall were 
located on different um, places in Skopje. They were street libraries, uh, but once uh, in a month they came together to form a completely new uh, new place and to frame that um, uh, to frame uh, other encounters between the people interacting with books. Um, later, we, me and Danica and Maya, also my friends, we made a research for Ohrid and we became friends first with uh, three imaginary characters uh, living in three different time periods. So it was like a kind of trans-temporal trilogue. And later we made friends, we became friends with the streets of Ohrid. Each one of us uh, uh, ch has chosen a street. And we tried to immerse and to understand it, to be present to it and to forgive it, to map its wounds and to map also the beautiful sights or what I say, the blooms of it. And later to propose minimal interventions for uh, that street. Uh, I would like to introduce an example that is not precisely a poem drawing. We didn't introduce that uh, in order not to impose it as a methodology. Uh, this is Victoria Victano Vitanova, uh, one of the students that I had the honor to um, to meet at uh, the seminar uh, Zupancic at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, she had an enhanced sensitivity to uh, cinematic techniques. So when we ask uh, drawings about the city of Ljubljana, uh, she made a movie out of it. And because uh, it was a super long movie, it was a very serious one, she got the critic that it was not precisely understandable uh, uh, where is the encounter be between her and the um, and the artwork and the city to the art and the city through the artwork and and because of that she uh, surprised us and she make a uh, deconstruction of the movie and a self-analysis of that uh, inventing an alphabet feeling so while John Haydock in Vladivostok has his uh, characters, which are actually urban elements. She went beyond that and she made this urban feelings characters of her alternative city. She made a poem for each one of, uh, each one of them. And by doing that, that, these words were not abstract notions anymore, but it was her embodied experience of that. This is how each spatial motion was transformed into a spatial element and later connect, connected and analyzed to human perspective in these uh, sections made on the way. Another very uh, important collaboration that I experienced in my life is with uh, my uh, friend, my close friend, Ilina Cvetkova. Uh, she, we met when we met uh, she was my student but later uh, we encountered each other like two years late after that <laughs> after that kind of encounter and we lived actually in a symbiotic uh, relationship a friendship uh, co-drawing co uh, co-living and everything and in when you are this close you always have this moment where, where you have a fight so in, in order to avoid any verbal conflict, we decided to just have a bu uh, take a bus, travel somewhere, and draw. And we, and we went to Trieste. So this is how the Trieste territory looks like in reality. And this is how we, the two of us, perceived it. You and mapped it two weeks uh, later after the trip. So we tried to, on the real scale of the map, although it was hand drawn, it was a real scale. Or it was a real scale. Scale. We superimposed axonometries, perspectives, feelings. We also wrote about uh, what we experienced there. There, checking all the time, um, 
between each other uh, what actually happened and did it actually happen on different locations. Um, what, what, what was also interesting is uh, the degree of familiarity that uh, this map contains. Uh, when we had a presentation in Delft, it, uh, this was one of the, maybe because of the uh, humans, human size, because it was a big drawing, so the people could come closer and go back. Um, it was very easy for people to relate to it and to start communicating, like uh, probably inspired by the uh, clarity of the perspective drawings or the intensity of the colors. Uh, and they started to discuss where, the, what, where did, where have they been, uh, to recognize different places, and to actually start to talk about their own experience of that. Uh, how we did this drawing, uh, as I said, it was we, it was a large um, format, and we worked each of us on different. Uh, uh, fragments of that and later at the end of the process which we actually switch the places intervening in on each other's drawing this is how the performance at the uh, um, university in Ghent looked like so as you can see that the drawing in the middle is the one that I uh, showed uh, but it was actually a very long process of other different collaborative drawings, who, which were also really related to this, related to design proposals. And uh, at the end, I would just like to uh, introduce something that uh, it's related to poem drawing, but goes beyond the PhD, and uh, it's something different that it's included in the PhD. So it's it's a place where art therapy and architecture meet. Uh, so, if we take that, uh, if we uh, take poetry as a kind of meditation, uh, it. I, I. I also. With the previous conference, I also talked about the potential of poetry to heal, the potential of poetry to uh, construct once and to refine one's own language in order to express authentically and to overcome. Uh, different difficult periods in, in one's life. Um, and during the process of meditation helps in that in this, but uh, during the process of meditation, the object is silence, but the aim is actually always seeing something beyond the self. So we can say that poetry is to create silence through alternative speech. It brings a deeper sense of identity. And it's, as David White says, the verbal art form by which we can actually create silence. So we try to create this kind of silence with my um, friend, Alexandra Shekutkovska, who is a researcher at the faculty of Brunschweig. Um, and also to include the visual methods, not, not just the poetry, not, not just the writing methods, uh, because the visual methods are very much more easier to actually access the unconscious. Uh, this is uh, her and her daughter. And here we can uh, see an experiment where she went back to an early childhood memory trying to map uh, import, important fragments of experience that are, that are relevant for uh, her own practice and thinking as an architect. But what, what was interesting for this technique was that we focused on the beautiful things. So although the drawing uh, speaks of a funeral, it also speaks about the, the other, um, how to say, the contrast with other beautiful things, with being close to the other people and the relatedness of uh, the person with that space. Because at the, uh, in the city where this, um, where this event unfolded, uh, the dead people are always um, a strong, the ritual of sending the, the dead person away is always strongly related to the house. It is a special kind of ritual. 
Um, so, so we focus on a strong uh, positive emotion and uh, we tried to, uh, to start sentences with, it is a beautiful feeling to blah, blah, blah. It's a beautiful feeling to just to be calm because usually childhood memories are, it's very easy to remember the negative things, but to actually dig in oneself and to uh, recover what is positive in you as a child, as a child, what was positive for you as a child when you felt felt safe and protected that love is another thing that we need to uh, remember from time to time. And this is my response to the same exercise, like with this simultaneously. Um, she's actually doing a PhD uh, related to thresholds and bond, bo urban boundaries. And this is how she's imagining uh, concrete urban places in different scenarios. So this is like a design related point drawing related to one passage. And because uh, both of us were traveling um, a lot, like we had uh, very different uh, experiences of, of, of what a home means. Um, when I ask her to draw a house, it is this, uh, in art therapy, they call it house three person exercise. Uh, she actually made a tower uh, as a collage of all of her um, ha housing experiences, aiming to understand how can this, how can she integrate this, uh, the knowledge of these uh, experiences, the knowledge of, of the, this thing inside oneself into her actual practice. And this is the final exercise that we did. I mean, there were many of them. I showed just three of them. So this is the box, the self box uh, exercise where the task was to perceive oneself spatially. And from the outside, we used to represent uh, how do we think that the people see us like how do we represent ourselves to the world and from the inside it is what we actually are and what are we hiding from the world and of course the emphasis were also the openings as transitions where we flow out of the self in order in, or in order to reach an encounter with another so this is what uh what she did and yes uh this is my final slide and it is a drawing of a fragment of my place of birth and, and my current mode of development, spatial development in, in life. And um, I think that a lot of the poem drawing, uh, that a lot of the possibilities that the poem drawing offers is this uh, continuous self-cognition and this continuous self-understanding that actually helps us to become friends with oneself to understand ourselves in all the in all the shadow in order in order to be able to give something uh, um, and, and to help someone else and to understand someone else uh, through designing and and so on and so on so um, yes, I would like to conclude this um, presentation with one uh, citation also from David White. Um, the ultimate touchdown of friendship is not improvement, neither of the self nor of the other. The ultimate touchdown of friendship is witness the privilege of having been seen by someone and the equal privilege of being granted the sight of the essence of another. The ultimate touchdown of friendship is not improvement, neither of the self nor of the other. The ultimate touchdown of friendship is witness, the privilege of having been seen by someone and the equal privilege of being granted the sight of the essence of another. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Victoria, for this um, living, interactive, and healing approach to urban places. Thank you very much. Really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, presentation is from Luke Powells. He is a member of the Working Group 3, and he is a full professor of visual research methods at the University of Antwerp at the Faculty of Social Sciences. His researches are focused on visual research methodologies, visual ethics, family photography, photography, website analysis, anthropological filmmaking, visual corporate culture, urban culture, and scientific visualization. Luke, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much, okay. Esteban. Uh, I also pre-recorded my presentation because this week in my, I, I got a cold and my, my voice was fading. So I was afraid that it would be lost today. So I pre-recorded it. It's also a good way to keep the time. So I'm trying to... So good afternoon to you all. <clears throat> Writing urban places through visual essays and photo poetry. Now I, I will first try to situate the visual essay and photo poetry within the broader field of visual methods. Because visual methods indeed encompass a wide variety of approaches geared at different aspects of research. So in fact, we may discern methods for data collection. You can think about sampling methods, search methods, archival research, and then methods for analysis of visual materials like semiotics, rhetoric, iconology, discourse analysis, etc., and methods for data production and data processing. And finally, one can also think about methods, visual methods for disseminating and communicating insight. So today I've chosen to talk about the visual essay, as it seems to me an approach that comes closest to the central ideas of our cost action, writing urban places. Often the origins of the visual essay are linked with practices in journalism and documentary photography. But there are many other traditions outside the realm of social sciences, like for instance, photo poetry, that try to accomplish somewhat similar goals. So nowadays, the visual essay is practiced in different disciplines, sociology, anthropology, geography, the visual arts, health education, architecture, you just name it. Uh, and in fact, you had a good example of a visual essay in the previous webinar uh, by somebody uh, who worked in architecture. So basically, the visual essay is a sort of a skillful combination of images and textual parts thoughtfully laid out to create a synergy, a synergy out of the distinct contributing modes of expression. Today, the visual essay seems to blossom in a variety of formats and guises in art and educational spheres, as well on, on social media platforms and in mass media and activist spheres. It can take almost any form, a sort of an illustrated article, an exhibition, an art installation, and it that can adopt virtually any new feature of any new technology. The visual essay preferably needs to be defined as an approach, a method or a setup that plays out different expressive modalities in a somewhat open-ended, implicit manner rather than take on a specific format, which is so commonly expected for scientific output. There are a number of challenges involved with producing visual essays. One of the key challenges is finding a balance between particular views and experiences and more generalizable experiences and insights. And also the fact that a visual essay should be framed or grounded in a scientific discipline or a professional endeavor. It should have a, a solid foundation. Um, therefore, we should try to develop 
more adequate levels of visual scientific competency, not only with the producers, but also with the reviewers uh, of such products and with the readers or the audience of such products. We also need to explore and manage uh, different disciplinary expectations because producing a visual essay in a scholarly context doesn't imply a complete liberation of empirical reference or methodological rigor or theoretical standards. So in fact, producing a good visual essay is a very, very hard to do. The visual essay as a practice would benefit a lot from further experimentation and from a more explicit, constructive and a systematic critique of its concrete products. While I have long involvement with the visual essay, I started to look at the photo poetry tradition only recently. This practice to an important degree resembles the visual essay, though it sometimes only consists of just one photograph and one poem made by different persons. Now I will come back to the issue of collaboration in visual essays and photo poetry later. Now what poetry is can probably be better answered by scholars in our action who are more competent in this domain. But I only want to say here that I wouldn't, wouldn't limit photo poetry to combinations of poems and photographs sensu stricto, but open up for any combination of, let's say, evocative texts and images. So not just poems and not just photographs. So maybe the visual essay may be the more inclusive term anyway. Over the past decades, I've tried my hand at producing a number of urban visual essays in a number of different ways. Sometimes I just use black and white images. At other times, I chose color images. Sometimes I used extensive captions to go with the images. And sometimes I did without any captions. But I always had a sort of an evocative introductory text. Some of my visual essays consist of standard format images while others use panoramic images. Uh, some are just a series of single images with captions, while others are series of paired images, so two on a page. Uh, it always remains a sort of a learning process, producing a visual essay to really determine and to find out what works best for your audience. The themes of my visual essays included subjects such as globalization, health communication, sustainability, and science of the city. Going from methods to assignments. We had some discussions in our working group three about what constitutes a method. How could we make sure that the collected methods could be applied to writing urban places? And when is something really a method or when is it rather a theory or just a concept, not a clear roadmap for accomplishing something concretely? So in fact, our field of opportunities proved too vast and therefore we decided at some point to move to very practical approaches in the form of assignments, which we then could apply in the cities, which we are hopefully able to visit in the course of our cost action. And then we would be able to generate some original empirical output from within the action. So what are the concrete options for producing a visual essay or for producing a photo poetry application. First of all, we could go for producing both images and evocative texts by ourselves and present them in expressive format. So the typical visual essay in the social sciences. Or the second option is that we would work together with a writer or a photographer to produce a new truly collaborative word image text. Thirdly, we could try to just select existing images on a city 
and write the poems and text ourselves that resonate with them. Or fourth, we could start from a poem in a text on a city and then produce images to go along with them. And fifth, we can just try to pair existing images with existing poems and text about the city and try to combine them into a compelling whole. So in photo poetry and photo text traditions, as described by and theorized by uh, Michael Noth, the collaborative mode seems the most dominant. So think about options three and four, while visual essays in the social sciences are more often self-collaborative or cumulative in nature, meaning that the same author would make both the images and produce the texts themselves. At our last cost meeting in Limerick, I had the pleasure to work together with Anna, Anna Ryan Maloney, one of the local organizers of this most interesting event. And so we decided to produce a collaborative visual essay on Limerick. This was the first time that I did a collaborative visual essay, and it was a very interesting and enjoyable little experiment uh, of which the results will be published in the forthcoming issue of Writing Place. So this is just to illustrate that uh, doing these assignments during our meetings is really uh, a useful and productive option to produce some empirical outcome. So this is it, a very short introduction in what constitutes a visual essay or a photo poetry application. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Luke, for this clear enlightening and rigorous presentation. Mm. Now we're going to uh, call Eliana Sousa Santos. She's a member of the working group too. She's an architect, researcher, and an assistant professor of architecture. She has a PhD from the University of London. And in her researches, she explores narratives of places and writing historical essays as travel diaries. So Eliana, uh, it's to you. We can't hear you. Now you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank now. you. Hi. Sorry about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, um, all of the members of the, the Cost Action, the organizers of this event, Lauren, Carlos, and Esteban, who is uh, hosting this session. Uh, this short presentation will address the photographic and narrative essays as a methodology that I've been working with and that allows to explore the histories and stories of places and to reveal, hopefully, constellations of associations between artifacts and narratives, between the space, the geographical space and novels, histories, architecture and art. Our team, constituted by myself and by the photographer Tiago Silva Nunes recently, or in the last four years, published three series of essays in the national newspaper Publico that were written and photographic journeys through the landscape and history, uh, following, to some extent, following the example of W.G. Zebel's expeditions through a geographic space that reveal a complex structure between place and history. In 2017, we traveled through the southwest of the United States, a, a territory marked by large scale works of art of uh, Robert Smithson, Nancy Holt, Michael Heitzer, James Durrell, Walter de Maria, and Donald Judd. That, and all these works and the territory itself, that revealed the legacy of destruction since the construction of the Union, the United States Union, to the present. In 2018, 
a journey through the Alps allowed us to consider the question of European cultural identity, the debated in contested territories, the French, Swiss, German, Austrian, and Italian borders, and we passed through places in history that evoked a series of wars since the Napoleonic Wars to the Second World War. In 2019, we, tra we traveled through the Japanese archipelago, exploring how architecture, film, and literature reflected some tragic events of Jap Japanese history. Our methodology for each project follows a similar pattern. We start by reading, selecting bibliography, as well as considering artworks and films and that, that are in some ways related to the territory, and by creating a conceptual map that to some extent overlaps with the geographical map. In the first trip to, to the North American Southwest, we were guided by several authors. They were basically art and architectural historians who reflected about history and time while looking at artifacts of this place. Those included Abby Warburg, George Kubler, Rainer Bannon here in the image, and Lucy Lippert. The first, this first trip was structured in five essays that allowed us to reflect about several subjects, the history of North American occupation through railways, the extractive industries, the secret activities of the American army, and so forth. The trip to the Alps was inspired by the writings of W.G. Zebel, which I already mentioned, uh, Zebel, Mary Shelley, Stendhal, and Aldo Rossi, among others, such as Simone Beauvoir and Thomas Mann, also here in the picture. We designed a tour of four essays following Zebel's Ritorno in Patria and his footsteps uh, in the, the small town of Vertach, Mary Shelley's lockdown in Geneva and compared Stendhal's obsession with Milan with also with Aldo Rossi's childhood, childhood memories. Our trip to Japan was guided by the works of Haruki Murakami, Junichiro Tanizaki, Yoko Tawada, and Yasujiro Ozu, among others. We designed the structure of five essays that took, took us from the Tokyo of the 1960s with its futurist meta metabolist buildings, but also with its protests to the Japan of the ancient Tokaido, the nuclear destruction of Hiroshima, and to the north of an imagined post-apocalyptic future. After the plan, so, so this was, I was describing the, the planning of the trips, comes the journey itself. We follow the itinerary as strictly as possible, since we already defined some themes and arguments we want to address and the number of essays necessary to address them. In many instances, the nature of the essays changed slightly after visiting the sites, after visiting the landscapes, either natural, rural, or urban. And we tend to shift some of the key points we want to address. The journey allows us to find remains of events that are part of the collective memory. And although they are invisible, they are still perceptible in, in some places. Sometimes we, we eerily see an image described by an author we have been reading. And these are usually the moments that are photographed and represented in the visual part of the essays. So, this is one example of one of these events. When we recognize the strength of the place, it's something that will become an image that can take the reader also in a journey, like Zebal defined, into a time and space that is partially reconstructed in the light of the photograph or in the format of the photograph. In this image here, it suggested to us Zebald's description in his book Vertigo about Stendhal's visit to the site of uh, the Battle of Marengo, some months after the, the actual battle. And I'm going to quote. Now, however, he gazed upon the plain, noted the few stark trees, 
and saw, scattered over a vast area, the bones of perhaps 16,000 men and 4,000 horses that had lost their lives there, already bleached and shining with dew. End of quote. And this is actually in the site of the Battle of Marengo. And to some extent, it's a, a place that evokes this description. And that that's Zebald um, defines as the end of Stendhal's innocence and enthusiasm about the army. So this is just one example of one of the images of, in one of the essays. So in the final stage of the process is the writing up actually of the essays and the editing of the photographs. More research ensues, some authors gain more prominence in the final stage while others have a smaller place in the larger narrative. But in the end, we always think of these uh, series as also as works in progress. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for your comments. Thank you very much, Liana, for this original and sensitive approach to, to landscapes. Uh, for ending this uh, session, before the respondents, of course, we have uh, the presentation of Marikela Sepe. Marikela, unfortunately, she's not he here with us, but she sent us uh, her presentation. Uh, Marikela is a member of the working group three. She's a researcher in urban planning at the EFMED National Research Council and contract professor at the DARC University of Naples, Federico II. She is also a journalist and her research interests include urban landscape analysis and planning, urban design, place identity, experiential paths, healthy city, livable public space, territorial and environmental planning and creative urban regeneration. So Carlos, you can send the presentation of Marikela. Good morning. The title of the presentation is The Placemaker Method. The method placemaker is a method of urban analysis and design which both detects and writes elements that not feature in traditional mapping and which constitute the contemporary identity of the places and identifies appropriate project interventions. References in this sense include Kevin Lynch, Gordon Caller, Matthew Cammona and Marikela Sepe. The method is uh, divided in two parts, the part of analysis and the parts of design. The parts of analysis is the part that we will talk about in this uh, illustration, in this presentation. So, the five parts of analysis include the anticipator analysis, the perceptive and the nominative description of the elements, the identification with traditional cartography of the elements required for area description, the identification of place elements perceived by users of places through a questionnaire for visitors and at the end the processing of the collective information with the construction of the graphic system symbols and the construction of the complex map of analysis with the written the, of the places. So objectives. This uh, mm, uh, case study that we will uh, illustrate in a few moments is in the, con in the context of the European Project Culture 2007-2013 titled Preserving Places, Managing Mass Tourism, Urban Conservation and the Quality of Life in Historic Centres. This um, European project was carried out with the National Research Council. There is um, the Trevi Pantheon Path in Rome that you can see here that bring people to Pantheon uh, to the Fontana di Trevi, passing by the Adrianeum. This is interested by recent, quite recent uh, operation of pedestrianization. So this is the reason because this area is quite congested. Here you can see the denominative and the perceptive description database. The first include the constructed elements, natural elements, transportation, modern people. 
The second includes smell, taste, sound, touch, visual, global perception. For example, interesting is the sound perception of the noise of the water, which is surprising, while the construct elements include the scenic fountain in white mar marble, uh, here we, st we stay in the Trevi uh, Square, which is a hike. Then we see the graphic survey that consists in sketching the place. The sketches will represent the area in question according to a visual perceptive standpoint and will be supported by notation where necessary. Here you can see the photographic and video survey of the whole study area. This taking which uh, had to be um, carried out taking care to record facts rather than an interpretation of the places. Some images include before Piazza Trevi, then Piazza della Rotonda, then other part of the paths. Then you can see the traditional analysis at urban scale, in this case, and at territorial scale. In a terri on the urban scale, you can see public squares, both regular and irregular flights, places of historic and cultural interest, churches, urban voids, axes, interesting perspectives. Then we have phase four, the questionnaire. The question is administered to people who use the place. Uh, question include, are there any things which bother you? What is the symbol of the city? If you could change anything, what would you do? Um, uh, among the, the question, what is interesting are some answers. For example, to the question, can you compare this area to another area in Rome or in other city? Answers include Colosseum and all sorts of places throughout Europe and America. Nobody was able to say why these monuments were comparable to the study area, denoting a certain confusion among some tourists. This happens sometimes when there are many people in the place, so it's difficult to see all the parts um, of the area around you. Then you have phase five. This consists in the construction of the graphical system of symbols. This is the general one where we include everything, so perception, um, places, um, pace, uh, natural elements, and so on. But when you construct the map of analysis, you include the peculiarities. Here you can see the peculiarities of this very interesting stretch of room. And in this um, picture with the legend, you can see, for example, the stick marking the route for the blind, the ochre selling souvenir, the live statue, the graffiti, the special painting for the blind, the places for commerce uh, or commerce selling local non local souvenir, and so on. Here you can see um, with more detail details uh, where the um, uh, as symbols, the elements uh, before mentioned, I uh, before mentioned are localized. So some conclusion with this interesting um, uh, area and uh, the um, written uh, or the writing uh, of this place uh, we had recognized a twofold anthropic load the physical and the motive one the question is not the mere concentration of mass tourism that affects many areas of cultural interest here visitors find themselves emotionally involved and this was a fundamental consideration in any proposed operation promoting enhancement and sustainable use. So, writing in Trevi Pantheon route in Rome with placemaker method as a result that it is subjected to an increasing use by mass tourism rather than residents and locals. This has led to the concentration of various kinds of trading activities that is slowly diminishing the perception of the identity of place and the culture enjoyment of the area. Indeed, this trend is triggering a series of events where, paradoxically, the culture is becoming a cause of impoverishment of the quality of place rather than the engine of sustainable development. It is important combating the worst effects of globalization and improving the beneficial effects of place identity. It will also allow more accurate control of the area and provide a greater feeling of security for tourists, passerby and the place users in the answer and the rendering sustainable the identity of this high representative place of Rome. Thank you. So we're going to send the thanks to Marichela by mail. mail. To the to
to the response, I would like to thank again to every participant for the accurate Esteban, we lost you. Yes, we lost uh, the signal of Esteban. But maybe we could uh, uh, announce the respondents of this section, right, Carlos? Yes, indeed. Uh, help, to help Esteban. Uh, that's right. So, so please, uh, Jana, uh, Kulets, um, I don't have your affiliation here, so I'm sorry I wasn't prepared to introduce you, but please uh, be welcome and uh, um, you're a member of working group two, please introduce yourself and, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Carlos. So my name is Jana Chulek. I am a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Architecture in Delft and uh, a member of uh, working group two. So um, to start, um, have several uh, uh, insights or comments uh, that uh, I would like to point out on this uh, very interesting uh, and uh, diverse, uh, yet uh, somehow similar uh, methods and approaches on writing the city. And the first thing uh, I would like to notice to kind of uh, hold uh, back to uh, uh, what Esteban said in his, in his introduction, where uh, we look at writing here uh, not uh, as, uh, uh, as a text in itself, but writing in its essence uh, uh, as an expanded practice of printing. Uh, and in that regard, I would like to connect uh, the text uh, to the visual image or to the image in general in, in a lot of the, in most of the methods that uh, uh, we saw uh, in this section. And in a sense, this uh, essence of writing as, as printing uh, equates uh, uh, an image and the text, uh, both as kind of equal conveyors of information, but rather different, uh, perhaps different types of information. And uh, although, uh, most commonly, uh, we see uh, uh, that, well, the perception is that image gives us uh, one kind uh, uh, of visual inf of, of information about uh, uh, the place or the city that we're looking at, uh, mostly spatial information about it and the details, while the text can give us more insight into the, uh, the temporal aspects of it and the characters of it. I think the projects and the, the methods that were discussed today both um, sometimes invert these uh, these notions and show us that they can work uh, collaboratively uh, in a sense and uh, produce uh, different types of insights than when the two methods are used uh, in their traditional sense so the image and the text so uh, not only this image present the text and this uh, the, the the space and the text presents the the temporal character uh, the and the temporal and the characters, but the image can also, uh, uh, as we've seen, per, for instance, with the poem drawing uh, and uh, uh, with a lot of the, the different projects can present also uh, the, the experiences of the different characters and uh, uh, of the events in the city itself. Another thing which is, uh, I think, common with uh, a lot of the methods today is this merging of the tools. So the methods uh, that are proposed merge uh, this visual and textual tools in order, in order to gain uh, new types of insights uh, into the city. Uh, and in most uh, cases, this information is more personal and more intimate and more uh, transient and multiple in a sense than it is in uh, traditional ways of uh, um, writing the city perhaps from the literary or from the architectural and urban perspective and so the text uh, itself uh, in some of the in some of the works becomes uh, visual uh, and the image uh, becomes evocative of uh, different types of events and uh, the last thing maybe to add uh, without going uh, into detail with uh, with all the projects, which maybe we can uh, 
yeah, have a little bit of time afterwards, is that all of these uh, methods actually offer um, a mode of collaboration uh, because of this combination of uh, both visual and textual elements to them. They open a possibility of, of different authors and different actors to participate uh, in writing uh, of the city. So not only through uh, the creation uh, of the images and the texts uh, through the visual essays and uh, 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 photographic poetry and, uh, and other types of approaches, but also uh, because uh, the methods themselves offer uh, multiple strings of narrative and multiple types of views to the city, uh, also different voices from within the city itself, uh, different characters in different spaces uh, gain their place uh, in uh, in the descriptions uh, uh, of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I'm, I'm sorry for the, the little problem I had with the connection, but I'm back. No problem. <laughs> uh, thanks for your enlightening comments about uh, the different presentations. Uh, now mm, we're going to have Klaske. Klaske doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to make a short one anyways. <laughs> so Klaske is the chair of this uh, huge and amazing project, project Writing Urban Places, our cost action. She's a professor of methods of analysis uh, and imagination uh, and on the uh, built environment at the Delft University. And her research relates architectural and urban questions to literary languages. Kaske. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Esteban, and um, thank you all for your very inspiring presentations. Um, while Jana was responding to the uh, relationship between the visual and the textual in the, um, uh, in the presentations, uh, I would like to continue on the uh, relationship between the, the reality and fiction, um, and also to continue with this notion of, of the different voices that uh, Jana was also responding to. So this element of, of fiction that is so present in many literary works and also in, in many of the presentations we have seen today could be seen as a limitation for uh, scientific research. Or maybe we, as uh, um, Alexandra was saying in her presentation, could the limitation also be seen uh, as an opportunity? Could this element of fiction uh, also be a potentially productive uh, field of tension. So if we look at literary works, many descriptions of urban places may be based upon real cities and landscapes, uh, but more often than not, there is an aspect of, of fiction or imagination at stake. So how accurate are the literary descriptions in the literary atlas of Portugal? Can they be seen as reliable accounts of these spaces and places, or are they distorted by the perceptions and interpretations of fictional characters? Are the places in the novels based upon real places, but exaggerated, displaced, or expanded? In the literary atlas, we see how places have been written in literature, but how much do we need to know about the writer, about the literary context of the description, or the role that the place plays, that the place plays within the narrative? Um, and the other way around, what does the, the partial view, as Donna Haraway would have it uh, when speaking of situated knowledge, the partial view of the literary character or the literary author have to offer us? I recall as Esteban our meeting in uh, Almada last year where Daniel and his colleagues took us on a literary walk along the former industrial buildings along the uh, Tagus, guided by literary fragments from an author who described the place in the industrial times from the perspective of the laborers. This literary tour helped us to understand how these architectures and urban places were related to social conditions and how these urban places had an impact on their everyday living conditions. So here, maybe the character was fictional, but the novel clearly described the reality at that time from a specific social perspective of a specific community. The balance between reality and fiction becomes a question as well in the contributions where we're not necessarily dealing with existing um, literary accounts, um, but with the subjective or should I say partial perspective of the author or the researcher. 
is the surrealist technique of the stream of consciousness that Alexandra Pornicesco was proposing, one that is testing the boundaries between reality and fiction. As we could see in surrealist literature, the urban descriptions of Paris by André Breton or Louis Aragon were celebrating the imagination. Aragon's um, Aragon's urban descriptions of the arcades in Paris, for instance, starting as analytical architectural descriptions, would quickly turn into dreamlike sketches of possible worlds. Indeed, the partial view of the flaneur or flaneuse as observer as well as participant may drift away with an associative mind, making up new readings and writings that may not be about that particular place anymore. As Alexandra said, this limitation might turn into an opportunity when making this a collective endeavor, when doing such a process of the stream of consciousness in writing with multiple participants. Uh, Alexandra was also saying that in this stream of consciousness, you get this kind of watercolor quality of the text. It was mentioned by Alexandra as a kind of metaphor, but this watercolor quality, of course, became tangible in a presentation of Victoria. The poem drawings presented by Victoria present us with this similar question about subjectivity. The, methods, the method of poem drawing advocates a sensitive experiential reading and writing of the place, but it depends, of course, heavily on the sensitivity of the researcher. To what extent can the researcher use her or himself as a tool? Could we adopt the position of the literary poet and work towards this idea of trans subjectivity that Bachelard was advocating in the Poetics of Space? Trusting that the researcher, like the poet, can develop a receptivity to what an urban place can tell us. To put this experience, this understanding into words and drawings and by the communi communicative power of these texts and images, bring knowledge about urban places across and even offer clues for design. Or perhaps, as Victoria was saying, to encourage us to establish understanding of place as a form of friendship. In the visual essays of uh, Luc Powell's and uh, his colleagues, and also the journeys of Eliana Santos, um, we again come across this idea of the voice of the researcher. Um, it is the gaze of the photographer that selects, just like a literary work, as, a, as well selects. It filters to present particular aspects of reality, such that they are functional to the story. In Eliana's case, a selection of writers, artists and filmmakers guides the journey. And Luke was giving maybe some indications to establish a balance between the particular and the general and to ground our readings in, in uh, disciplinary rigor. In the case of the placemaker methods, again, this idea of the partial view comes across. Uh, it's taken into account by means of such techniques as the interview. Again, the sp specific and partial views of the different inhabitants and communities. Uh, in Sarab's presentation that opens the, the sequence, um, we showed, she showed that these voices are by definition included in urban narrativity. When she was explaining these different aspects of urban narrativity and unpacking the different literal stages of Ricoeur, uh, she showed that these everyday practices, memories and voices are always included in this uh, stage of pre-configuration. Esteban, in your opening talk, uh, referring to Raymond Cano, it was very nice. I was just this week working with my students on, uh, uh, on the exercise of style by um, Cano and asking them to describe the same space, uh, courtyard in Delft, uh, multiple different times from these different uh, uh, points of view and uh, different, different foci, if, if you will. So should we worry? about the unavoidable subjectivity and fiction within our approaches and struggle to comply with the dogmas of scientific research aiming for objectivity? Should we, again, turn limitations into opportunities? Perhaps we should recognize that urban places are anything but objective, that knowledge about places is by definition a mix of objective facts and the situated and partial views of citizens and visitors. Should we instead embrace these 
experiential and social aspects of urban places and deliberately include multiple voices in our investigations, deliberately develop and use methods that include subjectivities, illusion and even fictions. This is a discussion that we may develop further uh, in a network about the scientific leg legitimacy of fiction, of narrativity, and to value this evocative capacity of texts and images. And perhaps I should end this uh, um, plea with a quote from the Certeau. I was just uh, going back to this 1984 um, book, The Practice of Everyday Life, or at least the translation, English translation, um, where, and I will paraphrase, he said, Should we, shouldn't we recognize the scientific legitimacy of narrative having a necessary function in discourse, especially when we are interested in the way urban places are practiced? He said a theory of narration is indissociable from a theory of practices as its condition as well as its production. And to do that, the Chateau said, would be to recognize the theoretical value of the novel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaske, for this final comments for all the links you established between the different uh, presentations and also for this um, synthetics, synthetic thoughts about them. Really, really interesting. I think we have a lot of ideas to approach to this uh, diversity of, of methods and assignments we show in this uh, second session. I don't know if uh, uh, before the, the break, uh, I don't know if any one of the participants wants to react to Jana's and Klaske's comments and interventions. Anyone? Okay, so mm, we're going to, to end this second session here. Thank you again to all the participants and the respondents. We are going to have a, a little break. I don't know, Carlos, how much time do we have for, for the little break before the third session? So here's the, the program. So we have 20 minutes. We'll be back here at 3 uh, p.m. Central European time. Okay, perfect. So we'll see you here in 20 minutes and maybe enjoy your coffee. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you.